Good. Okay. You have to start uh, over now. <laughs> now I've lost it. <laughs> no, it's it's great to have Dr. Martin here. Um, you know, when I grew up looking through a small telescope, I could yeah see the four moons of Jupiter and a couple of Saturn. They're just points of light, right? Um, it wasn't until I don't know 20, well, 20 years or so ago that we actually visited these places, got the real pictures of what they look like for real. And you know, it just it just blows your mind what what these things are. They're all so different, and they're also uh, unexpectedly surprising. I think was what you you kind of said. And and um, you know, she's got this great title of a talk here, "Unsolved Mysteries." So um, she's going to help solve those mysteries, I think, and tell us why they look so unusual. Um, Dr. Martin is part of the uh, Earth and Planetary Studies of the National Air and Space Museum. Um, it's great to have her spend part of her weekend with us here. Um, she got her doctorate at the uh, University of Idaho, mm -hmm. and she spent her, some of her undergraduate time at Northwestern and Wheaton College in the Boston area. And uh, it's wonderful to have you here. So hey, please thanks. welcome Dr. Martin. Thanks for having me. Um, so unfortunately, spoiler alert, um, I'm not gonna solve most of these mysteries for you today. Um, because when, when I had a chance to talk to Paul, um, I kind of panicked because I had this other talk that I had sort of recycled enough times that I couldn't really get any more mileage out of. So for you guys, I had to create something brand new. So lucky for you, did we just lose the thing? No, we didn't. Okay. So lucky for you guys anyways, um, this is brand new stuff. The downside being that this is brand new stuff that I haven't presented quite in this way before. So um, bear with me as I try and make very graceful transitions between some of these slides. But um, I was talking to one of my colleagues, um, Alex Padoff, who works at the Planetary Science Institute, and he's based out of California. And he was like, gosh, I've always wanted to write this talk where you just talk about all the weird stuff we look at every day that we just can't quite figure out. And we don't know why. And we've known about it for years and we still haven't figured it out. He's like, I wish I wish I had time to write that talk. So I wrote that talk. Um, and this morning I got some very hilarious comments back from him um, via email. Um, so hope, so this is kind of a collaborative effort. This should say Alex Padoff here at the bottom. Um, so we're just going to launch into this. Um, please interrupt me if you have any questions. Hopefully the images will show up pretty well. Um, but I want to start off with this really cool graphic, not mine, I don't remember whose it is, um, that I found on the internet where I really wanted to give kind of a snapshot of our solar system because I feel like, A, when you talk about telescopes, a lot of what you're looking at are, if you're looking at planets, you're looking at what's in our solar system um, if you're not looking sort of deep sky. But we normally sort of think about the sun, Earth, the moon, and the eight slash maybe nine, depending on how you feel about it, planets. Um, but the solar system is so much more complex than that um, because we've got the inner solar system, um, what I would call the inner solar system, depending on who you talk to, this is deep space. Um, I know, right? We've got these rocky planets. We have this asteroid belt, which we're starting to learn more and more and more about as we've started to do some of these um, sample return missions with like OSIRIS-REx. We started to realize how m diverse the bodies in the asteroid belt are. Um, and then you look at our gas giants. We've started calling um, Uranus and Neptune ice giants, which is like a whole nother thing. Um, and each one of these planets kind of has its own system. And regardless of how you feel about Pluto's demotion, Pluto in and of itself is its own little system, right? I mean, Pluto has five moons, five. Um, Pluto's like the size of Texas with five moons. Um, so that's kind of bananas, right? And we're, that Pluto's just sort of the first taste of the Kuiper Belt. And we haven't even really started to explore the Oort cloud because things that are really far away are kind of hard to deal with. Um, so that's just in our own solar system. Um, and so, our solar system's weirder than we think about it being um, when you sort of think about it in this context, right? Um, and this is a, a artist's conception of the Trappist system. Um, and I'm not going to talk a lot about exoplanets, but the point that I'm trying to get at is our solar system's weirder than we think about it as. Um, the more we learn about exoplanets, the more we realize how weird planets are and how weird solar systems can be. Um, this is the Trappist system. Um, and what was particularly exciting about the Trappist system is that there's sort of seven Earth-sized planets. Um, 
I liked, I, I, I always struggle with these artist conceptions, right? Because I'm always like, oh, people who aren't paying attention don't necessarily know that these aren't pictures. Um, but what I liked about this artist conception is from the like handful of data points per planet, uh, the artist sort of tried to put together the most realistic, and I suspect the artist did this a lot when they were drawing this because this is the best you can do. Um, I downloaded, I, I took a screenshot of this today from NASA's Exoplanet website. I was really hoping that this would say October 5th so that you guys knew how hard I worked for you. Um, but it didn't work. Um, but anyways, the point that I want to make is, I mean, between tests, which we're going to hear more about, um, and Kepler and all the other ways you can find exoplanets, we're starting to learn about things like um, Kepler-16b, which they sometimes nickname Tatooine because it's a planet that's going around two stars. Um, and then um, K-12-18b, um, Oh gosh, I had a note about what what was cool about this one. Tom, hook me up. What's like the big thing? Water. We found water, right. This was the one that was just in the news, right? It has water in the atmosphere. That's the data point we have. Don't extrapolate further. That's as much as we have. Um, <laughs> and then this one, um, around this, this star TOI 270, we have an Earth-sized planet, Earth-ish size, and then we have sub-Neptune sized planets. I don't know why they call sub-Neptune when it's like twice the size of the Earth, but whatever. The point being that the more solar systems we find, the more exoplanets we find, the more we realize how banana solar systems really are. Um, but the best one we have to work with is ours, right? Because it's the one that's closest to us. Um, and so we, we spend more of our time looking at our solar system and realizing that it's full of all its own little tiny systems. Um, and pardon? <sighs> you guys are getting it the first time around. <laughs> Just saying. I told you uh, there was a disclaimer at the beginning, but thank you. Thank you. Some, some, you can correct my grammar later too. <laughs> this is the inaugural. Um, okay. So, I, this is not a shocker. Today is International Observe the Moon Night. Um, so what I'm going to try and do for, well, not quite the rest of the talk because I have another, another experiment for you guys. Um, I'm going to talk about all the moons that aren't our moon for the rest of the day. Um, mostly because I just recently started studying our moon, um, but I got my start in planetary science because of how weird and cool it was to look at all the other moons because they're all they're all kind of a hot mess um, so I'm gonna give a quick overview of each one of these systems I sort of tried to give you this tough sell on um, our solar system is made up of all these other weird little systems um, because I'm most interested in the other weird moons of our solar system I think they're weirder the further away you get from the Sun so we're gonna sort of start at Jupiter and go out um, the Jupiter system which it sounds like you guys are gonna be able to see tonight um, with its four big Galilean moons um, these are were found what like 400 years ago I mean we've known about them for a really long time the more we know about them the more bananas they get um, but the Jupiter system is really truly a system I mean of 67 moons this kind of ball of yarn figure I really liked I tried to find it in a different angle because all of these other small satellites of Jupiter um, don't all orbit necessarily in the same plane so it's kind of this ball of yarn picture um, and then we have the Saturn system with its amazing rings and these weird little ravioli moons that sort of float around in these rings along with all of its other moons and it's got um, really big moons and these tiny little moons so um, with the most dramatic ring system um, it still has these really dramatic moons I mean Titan for example with I mean it's the only other body other than Earth with liquid at the surface I mean that's a pretty spectacular um, feat um, and it's in part because of this really dense atmosphere so um, Saturn's kind of got it all and um, also where I spent I've spent most of my time um, doing research mostly on this uh, little tiny moon Enceladus which I'll show you pictures of later um, so then we have the Uranus system so this is kind of the first of the ice giants um, and it's got a total of 27 moons ish I mean that number's probably gonna change um, but it's got all these kind of larger round really exciting moons that we've only seen once we only saw them from Voyager um, and Uranus also has rings and um, 
my colleague Alex, who kind of collaborated with me on this presentation, was like, you know, Uranus system is a little bit sort of like maybe it's kind of fortune telling. And I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, well, I've heard that one of the ideas right now, um, as we sort of go back and forth on how old Saturn's rings are and how long they're going to last, um, is that the Uranus system, the rings around Uranus, may be what we would expect Saturn's rings to look like well into the future. Um, I think it's kind of one of those ideas that sort of got floated. Um, the whole idea of the Saturn system, its rings and satellites being really young is one of those things that's like intriguing, but like so far they're, they need, they, there needs to be some more evidence for, for that. Um, and then we have the Neptune system, which is kind of near and dear to my heart because I've started working on this project on Triton, which is kind of one of its main features. Um, as we talk about going to the ice giant system in the next decade or two, um, there's a sort of this kind of, do we go to Uranus that has more satellites or do we go to Neptune that has Triton, which was captured from the Kuiper belt. So Triton's kind of a sibling to Pluto, um, but it's a little bit closer, which makes it a little bit easier to get to. Um, and I'll show some more pictures of Triton later. But the other thing that's kind of bananas about Triton is that it's in a retrograde orbit. It kind of orbits backwards from every other sibling around Neptune. There's always one, right? There's always one. Um, and because of Triton, it's sort of like, um, it, you know, it knocked out a bunch of what else was around Neptune. Well, we don't know because Triton wrecked it for everybody else. Um, that said, it's totally worth it because it's such a weird, it's such a weird place. And then there's the Pluto system, which up until what, like 2010, 2011, 2013, something like that. Um, I don't remember exactly when these these guys were all seen by Hubble, but it was Pluto and Sharon for a while, right? And when they were getting ready um, for their flyby, when the New Horizons spacecraft was getting ready for the flyby, of course, they already knew that Pluto was really, um, the orbit of Pluto was really inclined to uh, the rest of the solar system. So they knew they were kind of kind of fly through the Pluto system. They just didn't realize what kind of system that was going to look like. And so they were really more concerned about trying to figure out whether or not there was any sort of debris floating around Pluto that might have been around from the Pluto Sharon sort of impact uh, Sharon forming impact um, and whether or not there was sort of little debris I mean New Horizons was going what like 35,000 miles an hour um, debris is a big problem at those speeds um, and so they actually found these additional moons so five moons around Pluto um, and they're kind of flying through the system and so they kind of needed to recalculate, replan their sort of flyby to kind of do that big dance that the spacecraft is going to do to try and capture all the pictures that they did capture um, and sort of make some, you know, you had to, you know, poor sticks kind of got, you know, just didn't get as much about sticks as we wanted. Um, but, you know, you kind of have to make those choices. Flybys are really fast. They're really quick. And the thing that I was kind of holding out on you as to why we also care the most, I, I care the most about the satellites in the outer solar system is because most of them had or have an awful lot of water on them. Most of the surfaces that I'm going to show you after this point, um, they're made out of water ice. They're not rock. They're going to look a little like rock because they're kind of grayish. But a lot of these places, if they're not, if they don't have liquid water on them, they used to have liquid water on them. This is Ganymede, Jupiter's moon, Titan, Pluto, Europa, and Earth. And these blue blobbies are just sort of a, a, the, the amount of water sort of normalized by size. So essentially there's more water on Ganymede than on Earth, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, what form it's in is a different question. There's um, hypothesized this really cool like onion skin model of Ganymede with sort of like water and then not water and it's a whole thing. But Europa is the one that we're most interested in um, right now. There's a mission going um, in the next few years to explore that ocean because we're very convinced that it's ice, liquid water, ocean, rocky core. Um, and of course, water always means more things, right? Like, like life, right? So this is, if, if you're having a hard time understanding or kind of envisioning what I'm talking about when I talk about oceans, I'm talking about sort of an icy, crunchy shell, a mushy water ocean, um, mushy at some spots, liquid in others. Liquid water is only one temperature, right? Um, and things can live in really cold water. We know this. Um, and so the idea being that we're kind of following the water away from Mars and into the outer solar system because all of a sudden when we start to think about the outer solar system being dominated by these icy moons floating around these big planets, 
many of them having evidence for liquid water on their subsurfaces, all of a sudden our sort of classical view of this sort of Goldilocks zone, this habitable zone that's just far enough away from the star that's a certain brightness and the planet's just the right distance away for the surface to be, um, to have liquid, stable liquid water, but also be just the right temperature, not too hot, not too cold. Um, but if we start to think about all these other systems in the outer solar system, um, we start to think that maybe this idea of the habitable zone could be expanding. So I had this realization. I did a lot of digging for a good picture of this, by the way. Don't just Google utility belt. Don't do it. Don't do an image Google search on it. I promise you, it's not going to pay off. So, um, or maybe it'll pay off. I don't know. So I had this realization that when I think about how weird some of these places are that we're going to talk about for, uh, let's be real, like the second half of the talk. Um, it occurred to me that unless I try and give you guys some of this intuition that I've built up over the years, it's maybe not going to be as much of a like, God, yeah, that is so weird, isn't it? So I'm going to walk you through a couple of sort of like first intuition, no-brainer tools that you can put in your utility belt. I actually didn't know what was all in Batman's utility belt, by the way. Um, so I found this one. So we're going we're gonna to sort of go through a couple of like quick and dirty like, oh, if you see this, then you know something's maybe not right. Um, because what's most surprising, I think we were talking about this on the phone, what's most surprising about all of these places in the outer solar system is how they were a giant surprise. I think there was a lot of people who were like, yeah, New Horizons is going to fly by Pluto, and it's just going to, it might look like the moon, which is interesting, but being that far away, like, it's just going to be this cratered rock, and like, ugh. I don't know if that's going to do much for us. And of course, Pluto was bananas and we'll sh see more pictures of that. So we're going to kind of run through a couple of like when we see a picture and we say, that's not what I expected. What does that really mean? Like, what is it that we're looking at in those images that's really like the big clue? So the first thing that I want you to pay attention to is craters can't lie about age. If you see a picture of a planetary surface and it's riddled with craters that surface is old doesn't mean that the body is a different age it just means that that top layer on that surface is old this is a uh, Rhea which is a moon of oof yeah that's Rhea a moon of Saturn y'all I did this like days ago this is Miranda this is like probably the best picture of Miranda um, which is a moon of Uranus and you can see it's it's kind of bumpy in here but there's only a handful of fresh craters and then you see these really kind of polygonal angular places and there's like two or three craters per place so this is an old surface and this is a young surface and Miranda is a moon of Uranus we've only seen it through Voyager um, and of course Rhea we've gotten much better coverage uh, recently with the Cassini mission um, RIP but you can see that this is a surprisingly young surface and certainly not one we would expect. And we certainly wouldn't have expected a surface to be quite this young. Because essentially you expect these things, they form, they're warm, they cool off, they continue getting cratered, and like that's the end of the story. For there to be this few craters, it means that there was geologic activity going on in these places up until the point when lots of cratering sort of stopped happening, whenever that is. You can pick your favorite cratering model. But the point being that this is young, and that's a surprise. And you can tell that it's young because there aren't very many craters on it. Oh yeah, I had another one, younger, older, there you go. The other thing that we often see is we often see really high standing topography, like a mountain, for example. But sometimes that's also really surprising because everything needs, a s needs support. So these are some mountains on Io. Um, this is a big one. You can see the shadow that it's casting right here. Um, you've got another one over here, and I think this is a volcano right here. The idea being that anytime you have high standing topography sitting on a planetary crust or a planetary, planetary lithosphere is the more correct word. You've got this root. You have to have something down here, whether it's a root like this um, under a mountain. You have to have a certain amount of support. So again, not my figure, but I stole it off the internet for you guys. See, I steal for you. So Olympus Mons, we know, is the largest volcano slash mountain in the solar system. You can compare it to Mount Everest down here or Mount Fuji down here. Venus has this really large um, mountain. This is Io right here. Io smaller than Mars, smaller than the Earth, has m more topography than both of those. So how do you support this amount of topography without it sort of just sort of kind of sinking away? Oh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Io is a moon of Jupiter. It's one of the, it is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. And I'll show you a gif later of like literally a volcano spewing right now. Well, not today, but like recently. So it's, it is volcanically active today. It is more volcanically active than Earth, and that makes it really special. And it goes around Jupiter. Um, so we have these really tall mountains. When you see a really tall mountain, you start scratching your head saying, how does that work? Especially on a really active body like Io. Um, so we're always a little bit suspicious that something's weird going on uh, when you have a lot of topography. Um, the other, th oh, there's the GIF, I promise. There's a GIF right there. This is a volcano erupting on Io. That was captured by the Galileo spacecraft. Um, so things that are small cool off faster. So when you see small things that have either really young surfaces or doing this, you start to say, gosh, how is that happening? Because cold, cold things should cool off faster. So where is that all that heat coming from? In the case of Io, it was a pretty s easy mystery to solve. Io is really close to Jupiter. It's getting tidally flexed by Jupiter. Jupiter keeps messing with it, so it keeps getting heated up. Um, so it's got to release that heat in the most efficient way possible. In this case, it's volcanism. Um, and so when you see a planetary body that's geologically active, Io, Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn, Titan, which is a moon of Saturn, you see these things being geologically active. If they're really tiny, you have to scratch your head and say, how are they continually being heated up? If they're still active, you have, or they're either, they're doing one of two things. They're either still cooling off, which you have to ask yourself, how did it keep the heat that long? Or how is it being heated up? Um, and again, my friend Alex was like, it's like an elephant and a mouse. And I was like, what? And he's like, well, mice, they're really small. They, they, have, they have all this energy, but they can't hold that much energy, so they have to keep eating all the time. And I was like, ah, all right, I'll take it. <laughs> okay, um, and then the last thing that we're going to stick in your utility belt here is compar comparative planetology. And um, you'll see a, a good example of this um, later, but a lot of these places, especially Uranus, Neptune, the Pluto system, those were all seen by flybys. And as a result, we have really limited coverage, sometimes wonky lighting geometries. That's really problematic. And so you kind of have to say, all right, well, we've got, we see this thing in all of these places, and all of these places have these things in common. So maybe we can actually draw some lines, parallels between the two. Um, and we can use each of the bodies to sort of like fill in some of the gaps. Um, so comparative planetology is really important. I mean, Earth as an analog is really valuable, right? Um, there's a lot of analogs. People who work on Mars spend a lot of time studying in the field here on Earth because Earth is a great analog for Mars and vice versa. Um, and so comparative planetology is really valuable for us because we just don't always have the data that we want. So, okay, I promised lots of pictures. Okay, we're halfway through. Sorry, thank you for being patient. I wanted to make sure you had all the things that you needed for this. So we're going to start at Jupiter. We're going to go out. I could have made this a three hour talk, but I had to pick and choose. So we're gonna start at Jupiter, we're gonna move our way out, and I tried to pick some of the best, most kind of common examples that maybe you've heard, but you hadn't thought of that much before, um, of the stuff that like we just don't know. And we're still, we still don't know. And a lot of this stuff is so bananas to me because we've known about it in some cases for like 40 years and we like still haven't figured it out. So we're going to start with double ridges on Europa. I want to start with Europa because you'll see Europa towards the end too um, because we're going back to Europa and I'm really excited. So Europa is covered in fractures. What is one of the things you're not seeing very many of here? There it is, right? There's like one here. Europa's got like 40 craters on the surface. It doesn't have very many, which means the surface is really young. It's got fractures everywhere. It's been, the surface has just been cracked and crunched and cracked again. Um, and this is the one that we think has a liquid water ocean underneath. Um, so double ridges are double ridges, two ridges with a trough kind of in between the two. Um, and you can see there's, this is a really prominent double ridge um, that's, I would say, five or six kilometers across. Um, and you can see all these little small double ridges behind it. So essentially double ridges have been forming and forming and forming over the course of however much history is preserved on the surface of Europa right now. So you can see one right here. You can see sometimes they create this sort of cycloidal pattern. Sometimes they create, um, sometimes if you take a false color image, um, you can see that in many cases, some of the youngest ridges have a different composition. They have a different color. Um, I can't tell you what that composition is, but I can tell you it has a different composition because it has a different color. Um, and you can see sometimes there's more of them. 
nests down here. Um, sometimes there's less of them. We've known about double ridges since Voyager. We don't know what they are. We're pretty sure they're tectonic, so we're pretty sure that they're the result of the lithosphere breaking. We know that it's happening globally. We know that it's been going on a really long time. Other than that, uh, there's lots of really good theories as to how you can get these things to form, and they're good theories. None of the theories solve the problem 100% of the time. Sometimes these actually change their morphology along length. They'll be double ridges, and then they'll become a, a single ridge, or they'll become like a triple ridge, or they'll turn into something called a band, which I don't have a good example of in these pictures. I mean, we've been doing this for a really long time, and I don't, I'm not convinced, although this is a pet project of mine, but I'm not convinced that we're any closer to the answer. They're tectonic for sure. You guys have a good idea, let me know. So it's kind of crazy to me. We're going back to Europa, and the feature that's most common on the surface, we still don't know how it forms. But we're going back anyways, because there's a liquid water ocean underneath all this stuff, and that's excellent. Um, the other thing about Europa that we don't know is whether or not it's geologically active right now. So I don't know if you all remember um, back in 2014, there was a possible plume detection. And this is kind of this weird composite image that I think does a really good job of showing what they're trying to show, but it's like, this is not an image. Just think of it as like an infographic. So disk image of Europa and this little white blobby here is the possible plume detection. And then um, the team that was working on this was granted some Hubble time because this, uh, this was Hubble data they were using. They were granted some additional Hubble time to try and replicate that measurement. Um, and you can see this is their possible replication. Um, this is something that the community feels strongly is possible. Um, but I think that there's a bit of a split on whether or not this is a real detection or not. Um, I would not be shocked to be told that you know, Europa is for sure geologically active in terms of its plume-like activity. Um, in fact, we would expect it to have plume-like activity. Um, in terms of the imagery that we have, we don't have sufficient imagery in this location from Galileo that would be enough for us to actually go back and look and say, aha, see, that's where the plume's coming from. Um, but considering how young this surface is, this is just another example because it's, it's like the spaghetti monster, right? Um, the surface is so young and it's clearly preserving a long record of geologic activity. Um, certainly hasn't preserved any craters, which means this has all happened relatively recently. And that's, again, we do this a lot. It's relatively recently. Um, but this is a problem we haven't solved. We actually don't know the answer. It could be a surface that's 10,000 years old. Does that mean it's geologically active today? I don't know. When you talk about geologic time, which is really short when you start talking about time and the sense of the universe. But um, this is a big mystery um, and, and one that we're hoping to confine or constrain even more as we sort of work our way to Europa. Um, and I don't remember the possible launch date for the Europa Clipper mission, but I have a slide. So when we talk plume activity, we're going to go to Saturn now in Enceladus, which is near and dear to my heart because it's the one I've been studying the most. It's this tiny moon the size of... Um, Washington State or the distance it could fit in the distance between Washington DC and Charlotte I tried to come up with an East Coast version guys um, because when I started studying Enceladus I was living in Idaho so Washington State was perfect it like totally hit home every time and then I moved to back to the East Coast and I was like I gotta come up with a better one um, but you can actually see this hazy stuff these are fissure eruptions coming out of the South Pole. It's more dramatic when you put the South Pole at the top. Um, but we didn't know Enceladus was geologically active. We certainly didn't know it was volcanically active. We, you can call them volcanoes, cryovolcanoes, geysers, pick one. Um, it doesn't change the fact that water is shooting out of the South Pole of this tiny moon. Um, we didn't know about this. Voyager flew by Enceladus. We were like, huh, Enceladus might be kind of cool. I don't know. Um, Cassini arrived in 04, and I think it got its first images of Enceladus sort of late 04, and then like this happened. And that was the end for me. That's when I guess I decided to study science. Um, but this is, this is a surprise. We know, we know that it's coming from a liquid water reservoir. 
we don't know what the plumbing looks like from that liquid water reservoir to the surface. And the plumbing matters. The plumbing matters because is this a lake or a pond kind of near the surface that's made out of something weird that's got a really low freezing point? Is it a global liquid ocean, which we think it is? And if it is, how is that water getting all the way to the surface before freezing, right? Without freezing first. Um, where's that force coming from that shoots it out as fast as it's being shot out? There's a lot that we don't know. When people model it, they model it as like a slot. And it's a good, it's a good start, but we're still trying to figure this out. If it's tapping into a liquid water reservoir and it's tapping into a global ocean, that's a really big deal because if there's any kind of life down there, it means that if we fly a spacecraft through there with the right instrumentation, are we directly sampling the ocean? That's really important for us to figure out because if we're going to spend the money to fly a spacecraft through here with a really specialized suite of instruments, we want to make sure that we are tapping pristine material. The other thing that's weird about Enceladus is, what do you see a lot of here? There it is. See? That utility belt's paying off. And then, what do you not see here? These are both Enceladus. Um, I showed this picture to my graduate advisor one time, and he was like, what is that? I was like, that's Enceladus. He was like, no, it's not. I was like, that's just the North Pole. He's like, oh, nobody ever looks at that. Because um, there's, no, there's nothing coming out of there. Um, so you can actually see, if you squint, you can actually see there's a crater rim here. Um, but it's just the rim. It's all been like, uh, we don't think it's been filled in like on the moon. We think it's been relaxed. Um, but the point being that Enceladus is not only doing this, but it's got this amount of geologic activity that's been sort of preserved on the surface. Everything from ancient terrains that are preserving this record of cratering, but also this, these tectonized terrains that don't look like Europa, but they have the same amount of tectonism that's going on, the same amount of that lithosphere being broken um, and um, sort of destroyed in this way, and certainly destroying whatever record of cratering used to be there. Um, <clears throat> oh. <laughs> and, then, and then we have this this feature, do you see this? It's real, I promise. Do you see this dark feature? <clears throat> right? So this feature. I, right? But I do have some, sl some slight, slight answers. So we actually found this feature as a result of some work that we had been doing, and we published this last year. Um, Dione and Raya have these. Do you see that? Can you guys see? I don't know if the contrast is good enough. Do you see these lines? And then you got these lines here. They're really straight, right? And they're really bright, which is different than this one. It's really straight, but it's dark. Um, so we actually went and mapped them all out. The pink ones turn out to be crater rays. Um, the green ones are what we've actually mapping. So they're all like parallel to the equator, which doesn't make any sense. Um, we have these orange ones that aren't in the same orientation, but not crater rays. And then we have this really isolated little patch of them on Rhea. And we were really trying to figure out what they were. Um, and we were like, well, they're not crater rays. They're not fractures. Um, they're not any kind of... Um, they have nothing to do with cratering. They're not rolling boulders. We kind of went through the canon of geological processes that you see on planetary bodies and said, could it be this? Could it be this? What creates lines? Um, and none of them match up, which means we have to we have to go with, like, you know, none of the above. So that's not very satisfying. So what we decided was um, that these are all kind of on the equator, and the idea that we sort of put out there, and we're hoping some really, really smart modeling people can help us with this, our idea is that either some kind of grazing intruder into the Saturn system or some kind of rogue ring material has sort of draped itself across the surface um, because it would sort of explain this pattern. Rhea, we're not really sure what to do with because it doesn't fit the same sort of pattern, like the same orientation. They're not parallel like this. Um, they look like they should be crater rays, but there's no crater where they match up with. So um, this one is still a little bit like... It was a little self-serving because I wanted to show you something I had actually done. But also because um, this is still kind of an open question. Like, it's a really weird feature. We think they have something to do with some kind of rogue material, either in the Saturn system um, or kind of coming through the Saturn system or resulting from the Saturn system. We're still trying to work on it. But it's essentially material that did not originate on Dione and did not originate on Rhea that's being draped on one or both of these places. 
that's really interesting. But what is it? Where is it coming from? What is it made out of? These are things that we don't know, um, but we really want to understand. And so we're digging a little deeper into some of the data to see if we can pull anything else out of it that we haven't thought of yet. Um, so we're going to move to Uranus. Um, and we've only seen sort of the South Pole. So these red buttons here are the South Pole point of each one of these moons. And you can kind of ignore the leading and trailing hemisphere. That's what the T and the L stand for. Um, but what's interesting is you do see a lot of craters, but you do see a lot of not craters, right? Especially on Ariel. I'll show you a slightly closer up version of Ariel where you've got these enormous canyons. You see them a little bit on Titiana here and Oberon. So this is maybe more what you would sort of expect to see um, when you flew by some of these satellites. But it's still surprising, right? So um, I showed you this picture before about how weird it is. that So these weird sort of concentric um, features on the surface that are relatively young, they're called coronae. Um, corona is the singular, I believe. Coronae is the plural. Um, but there's these 90 degree angles um, sort of continuously, which if you study faults, don't worry about it. But um, that doesn't make sense. Faults don't do that. Um, they're concentric like this. They're really young. And can you see right over here, there's like a big chunk taken out of the side. There's this huge canyon. Um, that doesn't make any sense for Miranda. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, so it should have cooled off. We don't know yet whether or not it could have been in a situation like Io is right now where Io just keeps getting heated up by Jupiter. Um, maybe Miranda was in that situation with Uranus and its orbit changed. I don't know. Um, but this is something that um, I have some colleagues that are working on right now. We have a proposal in right now, hopefully, um, to work a little bit more on Miranda because we think that these kinds of discrete terrain boundaries are really reminiscent of what um, you see on Enceladus where it's... Um, sort of this one really distinct terrain kind of abutting with this very like discrete boundary um, up against another kind of terrain. That's something that's very unique. Okay, Ariel, um, huge canyons I mentioned already and Graben, you can, I'm sorry that they're fuzzy, that's all we have, that's all Voyager gave us. Um, but these are huge, which means, I mean, we're talking that's 50 or 60 kilometers wide. You needed to have a huge amount of force to create these kinds of structures. Um, and we don't know how to produce that amount of force yet. Um, we're working on it, but these are the kinds of things, these are the kinds of problems where sort of early on people were like, we don't know, we made a couple of guesses, the data's not that great, we're gonna move on. Um, and there's some of us who think this is the fun part. So um, we're, trying to, we're trying to drum up all the different ways we can kind of build up enough stress inside a, one of these moons to create features this big. Um, and so I kind of hinted that this already that perhaps sort of Ariel and Miranda are sort of the, in, the, the Enceladus of Uranus where you have these really discrete terrain boundaries, these heavily tectonized regions um, sort of abutting these heavily cratered terrains. And maybe were they geologically, <clears throat> excuse me, were they geologically active um, in the past? Clearly, were they volcanically active? We don't know. Um, so we're going to move to Triton again. I said Triton's retrograde, so it's going around backwards. Um, and all the rest of Neptune's moons are sort of in really close to Neptune um, because Triton sort of cleared everything out. Um, but what's really, to me, the most exciting about Triton is that when Voyager flew by, and I still don't really know how this worked. I'm going to have to have somebody show me. But um, you can actually see this really dark line here that kind of fades as they w took subsequent images, which I'm still not sure how they did it because they flew by really fast. But um, this is an active plume. Now, we don't think it's like geysering material coming out. We think it's more like sublimating um, material. And so this dark stuff is kind of a lag deposit. But all these dark splotches that you see over the surface of Triton um, is all this leftover plume stuff. So we call them plumes. We think it's a sublimation feature. But the bottom line is... Triton, when, when Voyager found out it was going to fly by Triton and they were getting ready for this flyby, they were like, oh, well, Triton is going to look like the moon. It's not going to be that cool. Um, 
and in fact it's one of the youngest surfaces we've seen in the solar system so far so like what's going on there um, so this is kind of near the south pole you've got these discrete terrain boundaries um, you have active geysering you have cantaloupe terrain you have huge double ridges um, and these things called gute I actually don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but that's how I've decided to pronounce it. Um, you see these features, they've got these kind of white annuluses um, and these dark interiors, and then these things that almost look a little bit like volcanic calderas. We say caldera-like, which is a little dangerous because you're sort of assigning what's going on before you've actually proven it. Um, but Triton's, Triton's cr I mean, it's crazy, right? Um, and it's the closest thing we have to Pluto. It's closest in to us. It's kind of the only other data point for a body like Pluto. Um, and Pluto turned out to be really bananas too. I remember, again, my graduate advisor was like, nah, Pluto's just going to be cratered. It's not going to be that interesting. Um, and it turned out, you know, we've got right Mons, which is sort of hypothesized to be some kind of ice volcano. Um, you've got these water ice mountains. At these temperatures, water ice is really hard. Fractures like rock, behaves like rock. Um, but they think these are water ice mountains that are floating in nitrogen ice, um, kind of like glaciers in the ocean. But again, there's not a crater to be had here, which we really certainly didn't expect. There's only a handful of craters on the surface of Pluto that we found. So there are some people kind of whispering, is there still an ocean on Pluto? Um, we don't know the answer to that yet, but considering the activity that you can currently see on the surface, um, or the amount of activity that has happened on Pluto that's preserved on the surface is certainly telling that its surface is not only young, but maybe there was an ocean underneath that um, stuff in order to help facilitate some of this. So p there's a lot of open questions with Pluto. We haven't had the data down for very long. Um, it took a long time to send that data that far. Um, and Sharon was, I mean, in addition, Pluto was bananas, but Sharon was... Um, equally as weird, you can, th this angle is kind of bizarre, but this is Kubrick Mons um, inside what they're calling Vulcan Planitia. I don't believe any of these are official names yet, but we can, one can dream. Um, but again, you've got these really deep troughs. You've got a handful of craters, but you've got this weird pitted terrain over here, which looks a little bit like this weird pitted terrain you have on Pluto. Um, and then you've got some tectonics. I don't know what these sort of fissures are. Are they tectonic or not? I don't know. Um, but this is really, really surprising. Um, and this is new enough data that there's still not a lot of work um, that's been done on this. So this is kind of open and low-hanging fruit still. Um, but it's going to take some creativity to sort of shift our thinking towards what we can accomplish without drinking through the fire hose of data that you do on the moon and Mars. And you're just never going to get anybody to take that picture for you ever again. So what do we do now, right? I mean, I, I, I don't want this to be unsatisfying in terms of, I just showed you a bunch of weird stuff that we don't know anything about. Um, but it's, it's this ongoing process. I mean, we're, we're constantly collecting information. Um, as an early career scientist, I'm spending most of my time digging through Voyager data. Um, and actually, it was really fun. I was at a meeting recently, and um, I had given a presentation on Triton. And uh, one of the more senior members of the community came up, and he was like, you know that mosaic you were showing me? He goes, I made that when I was in grad school. And I was like, what? Your name's not even on it. I would have cited you. Um, but anyways, so we're continually exploring. And so I want to kind of run through some of the things that are going to help us continue to look at these problems. So we've got Juno, and I really liked this. Um, I think we saw something similar already today, um, but this eclipse here. And so the Juno mission is still really active, and I think it's really spectacular that they didn't have any plans to put Juno cam on Juno until the education and public outreach people were like, you got to put a camera on it. Um, so, of course, all this wonderful science has been coming out of JunoCam. Um, and then, of course, the New Horizons mission, which I've been talking about um, immensely. Did anybody stay up? I guess it might have been late for you guys on the East Coast. I was on the West Coast. Did anybody stay up for the Ultimate Thule flyby? Yeah, yeah me too. Um, I was in my NASA shirt. I was all excited about it. So, um, I word on the street, so far there's not another target in sight for the New Horizons spacecraft. Um, NASA's pretty great. They come up with stuff all the time. So New Horizons isn't over yet, but it's still sort of floating around the Kuiper Belt. We'll see what happens. Um, did anybody watch th this announcement? It was really exciting. Um, so a friend of mine um, 
from grad school is working on this mission. She was working on the proposal while we were in grad school. Um, she's since finished, of course, but um, the Dragonfly mission is really exciting. If you're not familiar with it, it's a it sort of looks like a quadcopter, but it's actually an octocopter. Um, so it's got these eight propellers, and it's going to land kind of in the dune field of Titan, one of Saturn's moons. So this is the one with liquid lakes on the surface, liquid methane, ethane, um, dunes, and mountains and really, really intense um, dendritic like river networks and valley network. I mean, it's just, it's a whole thing. Um, so they're going to actually put this dr drone essentially on the surface. It's actually much easier for a drone to operate because the atmosphere is so much thicker. Um, so it's about the size of, uh, what do you call those? Golf carts. Um, it's going to do some really, really excellent science, um, a lot of chemistry, um, but of course there'll be some pictures, so there'll be some geology. Um, they're anticipating launch in 2026 with an arrival in 2034, so um, keep your eyes out for this one because it's going to be exciting. Their website's great. They've got a prototype that they fly around in one of their fields, so you can go watch those YouTube videos. And then, of course, I've hinted at the Clipper mission a lot. Um, and so we're thinking that the launch is going to happen in 2023. The arrival depends on the launch system. Right now, my understanding is that it's going to be kind of a Delta IV um, rather than the SLS. Um, and then um, most recently, there was a round of discovery class with a small class of missions, um, proposals that went into NASA. Um, they should make their first down selection on these proposals in January. But um, I'm really excited about the Trident mission. This is a flyby mission to Triton. Um, with the idea of essentially trying to kind of make up what uh, Voyager didn't do. So kind of get global imaging, higher resolution imaging, um, and detect, try and detect whether or not there is an ocean underneath the ice shell there. Um, so with that, I'm trying really hard to get through this um, because there's so many things I want to tell you about, um, but these are my last two slides that I think it's the weirdness in our solar system that's kind of one of the best things about it. I think we're sort of ho-hum, this is the classic solar system. I think the more we learn about the solar systems that exist in the universe, we're finding out that there's nothing particularly classic about our solar system. It's just the one that's the closest. Um, but because it's the closest, it's the best tool we have. And so rather than thinking about it as one system, thinking about it of a system made up of a bunch of smaller systems, I think is a way um, for us to get more out of... Um, to, to think more creatively about how we um, look at some of these new solar systems that we're discovering and how we might be able to learn more about them. We can do questions now? Okay. Yeah, so actually, there, there's a paper that I've literally been hand digitizing because it, it's a paper from 1990. So I was like, do you have this file? And she's like, it's only a text file. Um, but she's like, but I only have a scan of it. So I literally had to hand type this stuff into Excel. Um, so it turns out that was that it, it, that's not a real effect. It looks like that, but when you add up the orientations or you look at the distribution of the orientations of the plumes, um, there isn't anything anomalous there that's sort of like controlling the direction. Yeah, um, I think it has more to do with simply the rotation of Triton. Okay. I know that's not a very satisfying answer. Yeah, it, yeah, I would call it wind. Triton does have an atmosphere, but it's very tenuous. But I suspect it's it's just enough. Yeah, the delta V is a problem. It's not insurmountable, but so far there hasn't been an inexpensive solution yet. <laughs> just some fuel. That's all we need. It is an orbiter, but... Um, Sure. So the, the question was whether or not the Europa mission is an orbiter. So technically, it is designated as a multiple flyby mission. And essentially what that means is that the Europa Clipper mission is going to be going into orbit around Jupiter. Um, and it's going to essentially be in these highly elliptical orbits where it sort of comes in for a close flyby of Europa 
and then whizzes around Europa and goes back out around Jupiter. Um, and the reason it's doing that is the radiation environment around Jupiter, Europa in particular, is really dangerous for electronics. Galileo suffered quite a lot of, um, from the from the radiation environment. So rather than essentially um, radiation hardening every piece of electronic equipment on the Europa Clipper mission and making it really heavy. Uh, the idea being that instead of spending any time really around Europa, it spends most of its time flying around the backside of Jupiter, like really far away from Jupiter. Um, and so that's really what it's doing. So I think right now it's something on the order of 40 flybys in the sort of nominal mission. Of course, they'll add more, um, but they can sort of change those um, change those orbits just enough over the course of the nominal mission to be able to get I think it's just about global coverage um, and the images um, and really, really very high resolution in many cases and some sort of targeted topography data and, and all kinds of other really exciting data sets. So um, continue following that one because there's been some really interesting drama with the magnetometer, which is the whole thing. Any other questions? If not, you guys are going to keep me right on time, and it's super grid. You guys are going to make me look good.